Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cybersecurity criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Laura Chavez. Hello and welcome to the Cyber Rants podcast. This is your co-host Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Laro Chavez, and uh, it is a beautiful Friday on the the morning of this recording. We are excited. We we pray that our voices would be heard, that the truth would come out with with great might and That's strength. The five, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That yes, that our voices would be heard, and that we would change the world of cybersecurity forever. Next, we move on to our beloved co-host and, of course, anchor man with the news, Mister Mike Rotondo. Take us away. Just a warning: there have been no chemicals ingested other than caffeine prior to the recording of this podcast. I, I did have two cups of tea, non-caffeinated tea, this morning, so I'm a little, little wired. It was peppermint. <coughs> Pepperman. Getting crazy. Sorry. I'm not going to comment on your beverage choices. All right. News of the day. Hey, the big news is unauthorized access of FireEye Red Team tools. Yep. FireEye got hacked. Uh, they believe it was a nation state that did it. Um, I'm going to point east to perhaps it was China. Because only a nation state could have taken FireEye down. Right. Boom. Yeah, it's not some guy in his basement wearing his hoodie with the tinfoil on the windows and mom bringing him his stokers. <laughs> like Twitter, it'll be some 14-year-old, like you said. <laughs> sure, like, he had a really good script. So anyway, according to F- FireEye, that's who did it, some nation state. Packers for Hire Group develops a new Power Pepper in memory malware. I just like saying Power Pepper, but anyway, it's a brand new ma- malware uh, that was found by Kaspersky by the Death Stalker group. And uh, it's hitting Europe and the Middle East since about 2012. It's now coming to a organization near you. Organizations continue to get hit hard by cyber attacks. And that is latest statistics, a quarter of global organizations were hit by seven or more cyber attacks in the last year, according to Trend Micro. That's not good. And the vast majority of those, 83% of those organizations expect such attacks are somewhat or very likely to be successful in the next 12 months. So. A lot going on. Hiding skimming malware behind social media sharing icons. This is a new thing. Uh, so now they're attacking um, social media and hiding skimming malware. And a lot. And, uh, and in conjunction with that, hackers hide web skimmer inside website CSS files. So be careful what you're buying online uh, because you never know. VMware fixes zero day vulnerability reported by the NSA. There was a zero day. Um, and... I'm trying to try to group stories together. So NSA, Russian state hackers exploit new VMware vulnerability to steal data. So um, one was posted on the 4th where they say it was fixed. The one on the 7th says that the Russians are now exploiting this zero day. So perhaps everybody has not fixed it yet. Payment card skimmer group using Raccoon Info Stealer to sign up, siphon off data. They're creating uh, fake web pages using Mephistopheles and um, stealing data. Uh, ransomware attacks target backup system compromising the company insurance policy. This is pretty insidious and it's pretty smart. You go for the backup systems first, they're not noticed, destroy the backups, then go after production. Makes sense. So more case made for offline storage of backups uh, as well as online storage. So uh, remember those big old tape machines, may want to get another one. Fishing campaign targets 200 million Microsoft 365 accounts. Again, Microsoft is in the crosshairs. Uh, as usual, and that one's out there as well. Zero click wormable RCE vulnerability reported in Microsoft Teams. So, not only are they getting no 365, they're going after Teams. Ransomware focus forces hosting provided net gain to take down data centers. So, now we're going after data centers. This has just been reported on the 24th and on the 4th. So, a lot of things going on, not all of them good, but uh, here's Laura to tell you about some vulnerabilities. Hold on, I got some questions. So, <laughs> Was that Death Stalker Crew? Is that was that the name of that hacker group that's releasing the? Yeah. So so they're it's Harry Potter stuff now. I just okay. That's they, fine. They, well, they were formerly called the Decepticon, so they updated to the Death Stalker group. Oh, so, yes, um, gotcha. Okay. It, I'm pretty sure they're with Slytherin, not with Hufflepuff. 
some very yeah. sophisticated. I we're gonna get ourselves hacked. I'm gonna shut yeah. up death stalkers. <laughs> Anyways, that's why I keep all you know. Recently, I bought some hundred megabit zip tapes, and I just have I've got all my data on zip drive. So there you go. That's yeah. how you offline backup like a champ for vulnerabilities this week. I guess the big one to talk about probably should be talked about is the uh, the Fortinet stuff that got leaked out by the pumped kicks hacker <laughs> who released uh, almost 50,000 IPs and some of the IPs even included .gov sites, which is, well, okay. Anyway, so this is CVE 2018. And here's the, here's the kicker here. And, and I don't know if anybody noticed this. So, so this, this attack allows you to steal account names and passwords using the SSL VPN service, right? So the, or any, any system that any Fortinet VPNs that have that running. All right, let me, re, let me back up. In any case, it's it's a pretty insidious vulnerability to have, right? Okay, because you're going to leak a username and a password that can then be used to log in by somebody. And so the CVE is 2018, right, for 2018. So it's been around a couple of years if you haven't patched it. And But here's the, the last part. It's, it's, it's 13379. It's it's elite vulnerability. It is, indeed. I, I don't know if that's coincidence or not or if you know, they plan that. But in any case, look, uh, upgrade to version 5.4 or version 6. If you're below 6, you're going to have problems. Um, so from 5.4 to 6, you're going to have issues. So upgrade from 6 and up, you're going to be okay. And so that's really the big one. Drupal's got some issues. Adobe's got some issues this week. If you're using Oracle, just like the last several weeks, they've really just been trickling out a bunch of random vulnerabilities. Um, this is not anything injection-based, but it's desterilization. So it's going to come up from a compliance perspective. So if you're running Oracle, make sure you get that patched. And that's it. But seriously, though, if you've got a two-year-old Fortinet SSL vulnerability, you probably should patch it because you're no doubt on the list for pumped kicks. I wonder if he works with Death Stalker crew. I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe you have to have Harry Potter names to work for their guys. Well, no, a guy named Harry. <laughs> I didn't watch those movies enough. <laughs> there was a guy named Harry. How Slytherin to be in their crew? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you have to have like a weird name. I don't know if they'd allow pumped kicks. I, I like Power Pepper personally, but yeah, Power Pepper is great. Power Pepper picked a patch of pickled peppers. There you go. It's the full the full name. They're just Power Pepper for short. Makes sense to me. Well, hey, let's talk about well, actually, an expansion on our previous conversation from last week. We uh, talked about some cybersecurity industry challenges and. The fact that it's a young industry and still trying to figure itself out and that everybody complains about the lack of cybersecurity professionals in the country, which, yes, it's true, we need more. But very few people talk about the severe underutilization of security professionals and kind of the big bureaucracies and all the politics that they're caught up in that are taking millions of valuable hours away from some very smart people in our country and elsewhere. Um, that are fighting against cybercrime. So we covered that last week. Let's dive into some other topics here. So one is this kind of product and tool gold rush that's going on and has been for the last couple of years where venture capital and uh, different investment groups are just pouring money into cybersecurity tools and products almost blindly. So there's this kind of chase. It's this uh, almost like the dot-com era of build a cybersecurity tool, you'll get rich. It doesn't have to be a good tool. It doesn't even have to work or provide any value whatsoever. But if it's got a cool name and brand and promises to do magic in your environment, then you could sell that company for hundreds of millions of dollars. And that has certainly happened over and over. Anyway, interesting dynamic on that. I think, you know, our, our approach is always, you know, people are your most valuable asset. But I think a lot of the a lot of the kind of unknowing um, people out there um, that are trying to secure their environments are, are caught up in this and they're kind of in the sea of infinite tools and products and technologies that all promise to do great things, uh, but they're missing a lot of the core elements. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Tools are not the savior. Sorry for you tool companies that are listening to us, but you know, you need a couple, we use them, but you know, you can't just buy a tool as a company and then not do anything with it. You can't fully deploy it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a company and they have, you know, five different tools with redundant capabilities. And if they just took one tool and took it all the way out to its full deployment model, they wouldn't need the other four tools, but they're still paying for them. And I mean, I mean, I, I went into one company that had 
a beta version of a very expensive software running in their environment. And they just kept renewing it and they didn't have the logins for it. And they just, because, you know, the guy that used to management manage it left and the guy that backed them up left and they just don't, you know, they're, they're not doing it. So um, you really need to do a tools inventory and you really need to decide what you really need and then fully spell them out as far as, or you deploy them as far as possible because otherwise you're just throwing money away. Totally. And a lot of people out there are probably, you know, technologists are probably side hobbyists, right? They do things like how many, how many chop saws would you have, right? right? How many chainsaws would you have? I mean, if you're, if you're cutting tree, if you're, if you're making tree art, that's a different story. Okay. So there might, there might be some tech like, Hey, I've got like 14 chainsaws. What are they picking on me for? Yeah. Um, no, I'm not talking about that, but I mean, just in general of purpose built items to have, right? I mean, you only have, you only have one microwave, right? When we have one fridge, well, I have two because one's full of beer and other things, but it sits outside. Again, you know, you're not, you shouldn't stack your tools, right? And Mike, you're absolutely right. And, and we certainly see that a lot. And, and I think the other thing that I, I see happen, right, for, for using technical professionals is that there'll be a requirement and it's like, we've got to have cybersecurity and the board will, you know, get IT or whoever else to hire somebody and when the person gets in, they'll, they'll basically bench them. You know, it's like they're on the team, they're wearing the jersey, but they're sitting on the bench. They're not really allowed to do a lot. And they've been asked to basically do a limited amount of things that are more for more like executive clout of saying that we, we've done this, right? Um, I recently did a pen test for an organization. And when I was going over it with the, the development team, the development lead said, you know, it's funny, I, the last time you did this, he goes, so we're, we're kind of an A plus. And I was like, yeah, just like last time. And he goes, he goes, you know, my, my boss, he's like, that's all he goes around saying. He goes, he didn't see the report, he didn't look at the report. All he heard was that we got an A plus and he goes around saying, we're an A plus. And so it's, 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 it's literally like that. Right. And um, I think a lot of professionals get, you know, kind of put on the bench and that's just, it's a, it's a waste of talent. Yeah. You know what you could do if you didn't buy so many tools, you could actually uh, afford to, to pay your security and, and tech professionals more and get better talent and create a better environment, which would get a lot more done. Sure. Or you could use free stuff. I mean, you could, you could also hire, I mean, that's a way to tell is like, are your, are your professionals intelligent enough to securely deploy some of the, the free stuff out there? Like I use Snort as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right. our works free, right? ModSec offers um, web application firewall profiles, okay, but it's not for the faint of heart. Okay, you've got to have some engineering talent to go in and deploy these tools successfully, but they're there. Um, I think another one is the OWASP Zap tool. So if you've got, if you hire a, a professional and the first thing they come to you and say is, a, a, and so again, you know, not talking crap about tool companies, but just looking at it from a business perspective, because your cybersecurity has always been seen as a, as a, as a big cost department previously. So don't make it worse, make intelligent decisions. So if you, right. if you do as a new employee is come and say, okay, all the stuff you guys had is not going to work. We're going to need these new tools now. And you know, any boss should question that type of rhetoric coming from a security individual that you just hired. So it goes, it goes both ways, right? It's like businesses think that in replacement of, humans they can use technology which is a obviously we know that that doesn't work it's a, it's a waste of money as well as as hiring individuals and then not allowing them to do their jobs again another waste of money and then hiring individuals that just want to come in and rip out stuff that's already working probably without doing an, an, an adequate analysis and letting management decide um, and then requesting a whole bunch of new money and new tools should also be questionable and it typically doesn't work either those individuals typically have a high turn rate and they'll leave in a couple of years and you'll be in what you were talking about, Mike, right? Where it's like everybody left and we're just renewing the beta. Well, and you and I have both worked at companies where the sales or the security professional is sidelined and is being dictated the security controls by some guy in sales and in product development because they have to get to market and they have to satisfy this customer and they have to do this, that, and the other thing. And, that's another problem. I mean, outside of that, it's the, oh, well, you guys don't make us money. You lose us money by making us secure. Well, actually, a lawsuit over breach of data is going to lose your client a whole lot of money, and they ain't going to make us look good. You see a lot of that, too, where, you know, the, the right people have to make the right decisions. 
And we're not seeing that in this market right now. We're not necessarily in this market, but speaking of like 2020, but we're not seeing it in the general culture of, of, of companies and that, you know, the security people are being silenced in the, in the almost sacrificed to the dollar when in reality, in the long term, by not listening to security first, it actually makes things worse. So and they'll, throw them, uh, they'll throw them to the pit too, to the right. Yeah. They'll throw them to the lions the moment that something in the application's broken or gets hacked or, you know, there's some company like security scorecard comes along and finds some big weakness and flags you, right. As a high risk. Yeah. Why so, does security take care of this? It, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, I think Zach would probably say, uh, not to put words in your mouth, but he'd be like, they didn't market it right. <laughs> <laughs> right, they should have. They should have mar- marketed cybersecurity better. Um, that it would have been. It would have been more. More. It would have been accepted a little um, easier in the process. Right. Yeah. Well, you look at you know the the CISO role for you know both small and large companies is a role that is still it's so critically important because we're all relying on technology, but it's still kind of shunned. It doesn't. It doesn't hold the same weight in most organizations as like the CFO. You know or or even the CIO, right? It's it's uh it's kind of just put down as more of an operational thing, uh, more you know just just you know don't let us screw up too bad kind of thing. But um, yeah, you know I think there's there's a lot of benefit there. But that that's another problem is a lot of the um, people um, growing up through the tech world, you know that to be able to kind of translate, there's you're so focused on the the job and what it is that you're doing. To go back and think of it from a completely different angle, you know, like a CIO, CEO might look at it or a CFO might look at it. It's a hard thing to do, right? If you haven't if you haven't been in their shoes, um, it's very tough. So I think there needs to be more more education on among cybersecurity professionals um, translating the the value um, of what they do uh, across the organization. I know that's a big struggle for CISOs, but it's it's still one of those under, understood things. And then on top of that, you kind of have that that level of breach fatigue, like, yeah, we've heard it so much, but, you know, let's just, just stay quiet. You know, we're going to keep going like we are. And, and well, I, I, pretty much, I had a CISO once tell me in a really large organization, I had a lot of respect for it. He, he had a hard time, just like in any big company, right? There's politics that are just in bureaucracy between departments. He told me, he said, you know, a, a CISO is one of those positions that has the illusion of influence and and the re, and and the absolute reality of blame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a thankless, thankless role. I mean, it is. Crazy. It is. It's like you know, it doesn't matter if you're doing your job. Your your the security customers, right? Which are typically employees. They you know they'll shun you, right? For turning off you know things that they did they were able to do like administrative access, you know, s- stupid th- things, right? Um, they weren't able to run mouse jiggler anymore. I mean, you know, who, who doesn't listen to that? How dare anyway. you turn off Farmville? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, gosh. Yeah, speaking of that, I mean, there's there are a lot of assets. That example right there, you know, productivity <laughs> can, can go through the roof uh, when you turn off Farmville or, or uh, <laughs> you know, so back, relating that all back to kind of how we started on the tools side of thing. I mean, tools are critical, but and I think a lot of organizations, I think it's, it's human nature to want the easy way out, right? So, so when, when a certain solution is promised to you through a tool vendor, you know, a product or service, um, that's, that sounds like it's going to make everything better. A lot of times that doesn't happen, but people jump on it because they want that, you know, that easy button, like the, the Staples easy button, you know? And so tools, you know, is so critical, I mean, critical, right? We have to use them. We have to leverage our capabilities with tools and there's some incredible products out there um, oh, yeah. that we use with clients all the time. So oh, we're cool. certainly thankful for them and thankful for the people developing them. I'm just a little annoyed by the industry as a whole, because I think there's a, an, an overarching weight placed on them. And I look at it, like take it down to a simple fact, right? Like look at a bunch of soldiers on the ground in war. If, if you give a soldier a rifle and great training, that soldier is going to be extremely effective. If you give them three rifles and not much training or not much direction or strategy, it's going to be very ineffective, right? Because it's just more crap to carry around. You know, you, you can only really be proficient with one at a time, right? I mean, yeah, tools, you could, you could use a handful, but 
you know, that's just kind of an analogy that, that shows how we're looking at this, right? We can't just load people down because most people aren't going to have the capacity to run all these things anyway. So why not focus on, you know, the human expertise, really, really focus on that in the organization, um, the quality of environment for those professionals and, and let them do their thing. Yeah, and if you if you're coming in, do it do an accurate analysis of what tools are deployed, how how maturely they're deployed, the return on investment you feel like they're getting at, at the current deployment level versus the cost of installed a new tech, right? And make sure you're thinking about these things, and and also leaders make sure you're you're remembering that having one guy run it all is not a smart move especially if he's, he or she's done a really good job of implementing a technology or a technology set. Now you've got to back that intelligence up with at least two more. So think of that triangle. You've got to have a triangle of human backup and resilience and intelligence and engineering to, to front and adequately support any one technology you have in the organization that is, that is the critical tech. So vulnerability scanning is an example, right? Or, or, or a patching solution, right? Whoever, whoever's managing Puppet. Yeah, and that doesn't mean spend five hours a year looking over the guy's shoulders. There's yeah. job switching, right? Where you change places where he runs a tool or she runs a tool for a week or a month, you know, to make sure that they're proficient should that primary, you know, get hit by a bus or whatever. Or COVID or COVID right. and a bus or, you know, all three. or A you bus know. with COVID. Yeah, a bus with COVID or gets hit with a death stalker crew or maybe pumped kicks, kicks you. Yeah, or get some power pepper. Pickled, pickled pepper patch. Pickled power pepper. Yeah. At the back of the bus. Well, there, there's another issue too that we could spend many episodes on, but I figure we'll just touch on today. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I, I call it the elephant in the room, right? And that is uh, a cybersecurity industry issue is just the sheer volume of compliance requirements popping up it's it's like the the requirement of the week almost um and that's that's just an interesting dilemma i think there's there there's certainly well intended right and i think there's a lot of great aspects um to different requirements um and and a lot of brilliant people working on them but from a business perspective it's it can be very very hindering like we've been getting a lot of outreach from um, kind of mid-market or smaller organizations uh, about CMMC. Um, you know, they're doing business with the Department of Defense and the CMMC regulation coming coming out is just mind-blowing to them. You know, granted, we could argue that, yeah, NIST 800 has been a requirement for years now. And so, they should, you know, kind of should have known or started to align to it, but nobody really dropped the hammer on that, you know? And, right. and so it's kind of just brushed by the wayside. So now CMMC, so that's just one example. I mean, there's certainly others with, you know, CCPA and GDPR as those came out. I mean, just, it's a big deal for companies. So I don't know. And I don't know what you guys think, but my view is that you're, you're kind of getting in the way of organizations in one aspect, you're, you're making them do something, which is great for those that would otherwise not do anything, but it also is causing organizations with limited resources to decide, well, do I chase the framework of the week or the compliance requirement of the week, or do I align to an industry standard framework and really build a holistic program? And I'm much more in favor of the building a holistic program uh, to secure your organization uh, across the board. No, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah, you need to, you need to have a secure framework, a, a standardized framework, not a you know, something based on this CIS, something of that nature, or, you know, one of the other many frameworks to ensure that you are actually taking care of the company. The other thing is that uh, I just ran into a client that was, did, you know, get, did the continual confusion of, well, we're compliant with SOC, so that makes us secure. And it's like, no, that does not make you secure. That makes you compliant. Right. So that's the next battle that needs to be fought as well. And CIA had one, one sliver of their environment secured and mm -hmm. there you go. So it's a, it's it is kind of a ridiculous way of thinking, but um, you can't fault people for you know kind of just not not wanting to understand. I mean, sometimes it's just it's a it's a it's a grossly large uphill climb to 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 implement some of these programs and organizations that have just been let to be run amok. You know, right? Um, where simple things just like you know deploying a tech to like they have a bunch of replacement techs for Active Directory if you don't want to deploy Active Directory, and I'm not going to name drop on here, but anyways. One of the more popular ones 
you know, we'll, we'll use the local security policy on the boxes, Windows and, and Mac, which is cool. And you can, you can do things that you could do in Active Directory with it, which is pretty awesome. But here's the catch. The individuals all register, so you have everybody's email, which is perfect. But in order to make a policy work, you have to match a username to a machine name. Mm. And people, uh, well, organizations that have, that have hired individuals that don't know how to deploy you know, one of these programs um, very maturely, they end up having the naming convention of all of the laptops and desktops are all over the place, right? They didn't have any kind of standardized naming convention. It's just named like whatever. And so now what would be a, you know, something that might take two hours to install on a hundred machines now turns into like an eight month endeavor of changing computer names. That's a good use of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, PowerShell scripts, you know, you can't get the users to run them for you. And it's just, oh man, it's simple things, right? That'll bite you later. You're just like, why? Yeah. Like in theory, this should have taken a couple hours, but here we are, you know, eight months later. In theory, the Death Star should have survived. <laughs> but, I mean, typically it did, right? I mean, that's just what they keep doing over and over again is let's just build a super planet machine that has a giant laser. <laughs> <laughs> Why? But since we're coming up on time, you know, we'll wrap it up, you know, with this. And that is that for those, you know, those people listening that really need to implement a security program for the first time with, you know, first of all, it comes down to people, right? Tools and technologies are great. They're helpful, but don't get overburdened by them. Um, you know, there's a, there's kind of a diminishing uh, level of returns that, that occurs, you know, the more you stack on top of each other. So keep that in mind. And when you're building, when you're looking at all these compliance requirements, just remember that putting an industry standard framework first and making that your priority, like NIST, um, CSF or 800-171, 853, uh, CIS controls is phenomenal, especially for smaller organizations where the other ones are, are, are less palatable. Those are you know, all great frameworks to follow and, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? These things are out there. It's, it's a, a prescription of here's what you need to do to, in order to have a robust and acceptable uh, cybersecurity program for your organization. So look those up again, NIST, um, you can search on NIST frameworks and then, or CIS controls, Center for Internet Security. Uh, take a look at those, follow their, their guidance. Um, just pick one and run with it if you're not, if, if other organizations aren't imposing or a client's not imposing a specific framework. They're all a great place to uh, give you guidance in order to what, what you don't, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel and make this up. There's no like magic or secret sauce that's all out there for you. So one, one thing to keep in mind, too, when you look at these frameworks, they look daunting. But in reality, if you're doing uh, industry best practices, you may be already 60 to 70 percent compliant. Totally. So, don't be intimidated by the spreadsheet. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many organizations we check that think they're in really bad shape and they're, they're really not that bad off. Um, you know, this isn't this isn't the mid two thousands anymore. A lot of the tech is you know somewhat secure out of the box as long as you don't muddle with it. Right. Um, and to Zach's point, if you know the frameworks are light, and and also if you're if you're a contractor like was said earlier, the new DFARS. Um, interim rule is out, so make sure you go and read what's required. That the magic sauce in that, unfortunately, is going to be required to have some form of a milestones chart with dates on your gaps. Yep. Keep that in mind. Yep. The magical plan of action milestones as prescribed by the Department of Defense. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how many people, how many organizations come back with above a 70% on that. Um, or request for extensions. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess that number's higher. <laughs> Continue to extend and extend and extend until one day CMMC comes out. Well, well, thanks again uh, for joining us, everyone. Have a great week, and we will uh, see you next time. Take care. Later. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Ants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Rants Podcast.